so much. And I am honored to be following the OG Jeff Williams. Um, yes, th this is What Shall We Do With a Vendor, S-Bomb. And it is <laughs> early in the morning for some of you, for me too. We'll try to get through this together. Uh, you are going to hear, and you have heard a lot about S-Bombs already. Jeff uh, touched on them as well in his talk. And um, there are so many smart people working on the first line problems of SBOM. How do we standardize? How do we generate them? Uh, here at Cisco, we've been generating SBOMs for internal use for several years, and we're still working on issues, there, um, the distribution and everything. I'm going to take a step forward and say, let's pretend that we've solved all these problems and you are a CISO and you've asked your vendor for an SBOM and now you have it in your hot little hands and it is integrated into your you know, favorite dashboard. Now, what are you going to do with it? So that's the point at which I wanna start this talk. Now you can sing along with me. Every section goes with the song, use it before you buy this software. Let's talk about pre-procurement. What are you going to do with an SBOM in the pre-procurement phase? You're going to want to insert it in several places, but let's talk about this first. Now, there are some things that don't even necessarily have anything to do with security uh, that you're going to be using SBOMs for, like avoiding licensing conflicts, like, yeah, we cannot use, we can't incorporate uh, con uh, something with this particular licensing into our own software, that's an immediate no. Uh, or you may have a bunch of business units that you discover through duplicate SBOMs that they are all procuring software from the same vendor, and you might want to go back and renegotiate that deal to save some money. So again, these things don't necessarily have anything to do with security, but they could be very useful from a business perspective in your organization. Another thing is to check provenance. There may be some sources that you absolutely will not take software from, and that's an immediate no. As soon as you see it, before you sign the PO, you say, nope, sorry, we can't take this. That's also very straightforward. Now, if you start looking at vulnerabilities associated with the SBOM, this is where you, you're going to start delaying things. You're going to start holding up the procurement. You're going to have some VP saying, look, I just want this software. Can we just get it first and then argue about it later? So there's going to be negotiation. You're going to go back to the vendor and say, well, you know, there's this associated with your SBOM. And they'll say, no, that doesn't really apply because blah. So it, that's where things are going to slow down in pre-procurement. And so I would urge you to be very careful about what you want to um, put here as a gate in the pre-procurement process that has to do with vulnerabilities. Maybe really big, uh, you know, show-stopping ones. But if you cannot get all of your management to agree that, yes, this is a, a case for stopping the procurement, then you're just gonna make yourself miserable going forward. So think really carefully about this. Now, some people wonder whether uh, you could use SBOMs instead of today's favorite pen tests or SDLC questionnaires. And my answer to this is no, that pen tests discover very different things from what is gonna be in an SBOM, at least you would hope so. And SDLC questionnaires are aimed in general at gauging the maturity of the vendor. And you're not gonna find that with an SBOM, except that yes, it might be a sign of maturity if they can generate an SBOM. Uh, you, you might set that as a low baseline at some point that at the very minimum, your vendors all need to be able to generate SBOMs if you're gonna do business with them. But uh, again, I don't think SBOMs are going to take the place of any of these that's going to augment the information gathering that you're doing about your supply chain, uh, not replace anything. So for pre-procurement, I would encourage you to focus on what you can automatically stop or flag. The, the, the very unambiguous parts of the SBOM, either, either it's there or it's not, either it says this or it doesn't. And then, you know, you can log the rest for notifications later. 
And uh, don't forget to come join me in the Slack channel after this if you want to argue with me because I love a good knockdown drag out Slack. So this will be fun. Next verse, use it for risk and vuln disclosure. Let's talk about vulnerability disclosure. Now, we already know a lot about vulnerability management. So what can we learn from it to apply to SBOMs? First of all, someone else's criticality rating isn't always going to be yours. We know this. And uh, in fact, if you are using different different methods of prioritizing your vulnerabilities for remediation, I urge you to look at a report series from Scientia Institute and Kenna Security. And full disclosure, Kenna was acquired by Cisco earlier this year. Uh, they have a great series called Prioritization to Prediction. And in the first report, they revealed what I thought was some very interesting data in research that if you compare all the different methods that you might use to prioritize patching, if you use any one of them, whether it's criticality or exploit available or blast radius or whatever, that method is likely no better than patching randomly. And I thought that was just mind blowing. Now they did find that if you use all the methods and combine them, you might get a, a better result in, in terms of coverage and accuracy on your patching. But um, this is something that you need to be good at uh, before you start using SBOMs to decide uh, because prioritization is still going to be a thing. You're going to have to annotate what's really definitely affected and what isn't. So you might look at an SBOM and a vulnerability associated with it and say, yes, that's a real vulnerability, but um, it's only, you know, um, it, it only affects these functions and we're not calling those functions. So you're going to want to annotate that somewhere and say, yes, uh, you know, not affected because uh, we don't call those functions. Wendy signed off on it on this date. You're going to need to show it to auditors. You know, you're going to have to pull it up. You might want to flag that later. If you change the code and you end up calling those functions, then you definitely are affected. So all of those things, and again, this is not new. We, we have this issue today, but just be prepared to do even more of it. You got to annotate what the disposition is of the SBOM. Do we patch or do they patch? And again, here's another issue that we have to try to figure out. It's going to be more with SBOMs depending on whether it's open source do we find somebody else does the vendor disclaim all responsibility if you patch it what is the timeline does it require recertification uh, all of those things and so if even if you have good remediation and update processes right now to estimate how much it's going to cost and how long it's going to take to remediate something you're going to need even more of them when you start getting SBOMs in the door. So you can't just bring in SBOMs and let them sit and not decide what to do with them. That's going to be a big problem. Also, we can learn things from threat intelligence when we're looking at using SBOMs and consuming them. Here's a good lesson. Do you even trust the SBOM? I can certainly see in the future where organizations are going to say, yes, we trust the SBOMs from these vendors, but this vendor, uh, yeah, it's always it's always really dodgy. They don't really know what they're doing. They just kind of wave their hands and, and spat out something that looks like an SBOM, but we don't trust it. Um, the same thing with threat intelligence today with IOCs that have been sanitized and they don't tell you enough. The SBOM is going to be as brief as it can possibly get away with being. And so if you have questions about technical details. Yeah, we see this in the SBOM and we got questions. Who are you going to ask about it? Make sure you understand how to do that. Another thing I want to point out is that there are plenty of organizations out there today who insist on getting the source code from their vendors and scanning it themselves. And if you can get the source code, that's great. You can imagine that a vendor might say, well, now we have an SBOM. Can we just give you the SBOM? 
And I expect that those who prefer to do their own scanning are going to say, no, that's not good enough. Uh, we, we need the source code still. If you're going to do your own scanning, please be very careful what tools you use. If you're going to use binary scanners, if you don't have the source code, um, according to our own data inside of Cisco, checking our binary scanning tools against our source code, we found that the binary tools are only about 60% accurate in what they find. And I have heard other people ranting and raving that actually the tools are closer to producing like 99% false positives. Sorry for, for, you know, binary scanning tool vendors out there. But anyway, from our own data, from the tools that we use, about 60% accuracy, yeah, not great. So if you're scanning your, uh, the, um, if you're scanning binaries on your own and you're going back to the vendor and saying, you know, I'm seeing this and, uh, you know, I don't, you should have listed this in your SBOM. This is the same problem that we have today when people are reporting vulnerabilities through a bug bounty program or anything else. There are some researchers who bring in great bugs and we go, yes, we absolutely agree. Good find, have a t-shirt or whatever. But then there are others that will bring in, uh, you know, some assertion and will have to go, you know, I think you really misinterpreted this or you didn't use the tool right. This isn't really a thing. And that negotiation is going to take a long time. It's very annoying for both sides. So please don't do this unless you're sure you can really find worthy um, issues to take up with the source of the software that you've gotten. Uh, because otherwise there's going to be a lot of confusion around the use of these S-bombs, and we'd like to try to avoid that. Now, remember to everybody, blocking is breaking. Now, there are many uh, organizations out there that will say, well, we're just going to automate because there's so much data that's going to come in with these S-bombs, and, and it, we're going to automate, you know, matching up the vulnerabilities, and we're going to match up all the exploits with threat intelligence, and then we're going to automatically block anything that we see. No, you're not. And um, even if you were perfect at detecting active exploits, in the data stream and blocking them, your organization, your customer is not going to trust you to do it, which is why I remember 10 years ago, I think the figure was that only about 10% of WAFs out there actually had any blocking rules enabled. I don't know what the figure is now, um, as somebody can tell me in the Slack channel, but I'm guessing it's not much bigger than that because the truth is that a lot of customers don't know enough about their software, especially legacy software, to know whether it's going to be safe to try to block something. I did hear about an application that purposely used SQL injection to update the database, purposely, and I'm sure the developer was very proud of themselves for having come up with this really neat trick. So you can't just block things, and so don't assume that when you have an SBOM, it's going to, you know, automatically add more rules for things. Which leads us to the question of who's going to need this information and who simply needs an FYI on these SBOMs. Think about who in your organization is going to need to see them and who just needs to know that they're there or who, who just wants to look at them, you know, every six months or whatever. There are going to be some people in your team who are going to want to look at them in depth, trace them, uh, validate them, and all sorts of things. Uh, and there are people who are just going to dabble, like they may want to do random sampling and go to a vendor. Do you, do you have the S-bomb for this? Yeah, okay, I was just checking. Think about that. And what is the risk and the impact of partial remediation? Let's say we have this uh, particular component in 27 locations, and we can remediate one of them right now, but the others are going to take six months because of reasons. Uh, again, how are you going to track that? How are you going to uh, make sure that you follow up on things? How are you going to explain the timeline? And how are you going to estimate the risk of that remediation? 
Is anybody getting depressed yet? Sorry. And then finally, everybody who talks about SBOMs, almost without exception, gets really excited about the idea of, oh, we're going to make social graphs and we're going to find out where components are widespread and where they came from and trace them all the way back. And we're going to do social graphs and it's going to be so cool. And I agree, they're really cool, but what are you really going to do with them? Let's say that we build amazing research and social graphs and we discover that some vulnerable component has now infiltrated half of the known civilized world. That's going to make a great OWASP talk and it's going to make a great black hat talk, but what is your customer really going to do about it? What, what are they going to do with that info? Are they going to throw you know, that component out? Is that going to be any different from how they would have disposed of it, you know, not knowing about the social graph? As my colleague Helen Patton points out, there is no terminal point at the end of a supply chain. There's no one end where you say, okay, now we've stopped and we've traced it all the way back. So be careful when you start graphing things because you may be adding visibility Visibility, I'm going to go out on a limb here. Visibility isn't always good. Yeah, it's it's not always good. Sometimes it just confuses the issue more. So be careful and think about what visibility you need because you're going to do something with it. Now, the final verse, good look, luck using it for forensics. Yeah, forensics. Know the limits of this SBOM. You know, when you're when you're going to start using it, let's say that you hear about a vulnerability six months down the line, and it was in a version of software that might have been in place, but you have to figure out whether it was. Do you really have logs on every component and how long it was installed in which locations from what date to what date? Again, I'd love to hear about it in Slack if you really can produce those from six months away. I'm guessing the answer is no for most people. So yeah, this is gonna be tough. And furthermore, do you know enough about how each component is used to know whether it was really exploited? Again, uh, from my work in organizations, there's a lot of software that they don't know very much about anymore. Either it's legacy and it hasn't been touched in 10 years, or uh, it belongs to another vendor. Uh, they're not allowed to look inside it. It's not theirs. Uh, they inherited it with, with, from an acquisition and all the people they acquired left. Uh, there are so many reasons why just getting an SBOM and getting information will make you have to go look at the innards of an application for the first time and go spelunking. And I am guessing that you don't have people sitting around waiting for these spelunking assignments. So you're going to have to figure out resourcing. How important is it for us to get to the bottom of this and really track it down and really either prove a positive or a negative? So um, it, it think about this. When we think about consumers of SBOMs we, and, and a lot of application security, we tend to use as example the, the top 1% of security organizations like um, you know, financial services. And we think of them as the end consumers of everything, like they sit there and they you know, consume everything. But what's really going to be more important are the people in the middle of the supply chain. If you are receiving and you are sharing and you are distributing, uh, you're incorporating and you're passing things on, as an entity in the middle of a supply chain, you're going to have to know what you want and what you're going to say to uh, other entities downstream about these things. So you're going to have to decide to the depth at which you can investigate something because you're going to owe answers to your, your recipients, to your downstream customers and to your partners. So the downside to this is that if you have incomplete data, 
and you can't find the answer, you can't prove a negative, it usually means that you, you know, to be on the safe side, you have to do a breach notification. So suddenly you're in the position where your um, legal people are saying, well, we have this concern because there was this vulnerability announced with this, um, associated with this SBOM. We know that we had this at some point in our systems, but you're saying that's all the information we can get on it. We cannot say for sure that we weren't affected. And they're going to hate that because everybody hates incomplete information. You get just enough information to give you more reasons to worry, and then you can't assuage that worry. This is something that you're going to have to talk with your, with your management team about. What are we going to do if we can't answer it? Because I predict there will be a lot of that. Uh, what about SAS? What if you are using a SAS provider? Do you go to them and say, we want your SBOMs and your SBOMs of your SBOMs and your SBOMs of your SBOMs, and they will probably go, uh, no, no, we are not doing that. So is it going to be SBOMs all the way down? At what point are you going to be satisfied as a consumer with uh, the, the number of SBOMs that you get? And again, this is all the limits of the SBOMs and the limits of the knowledge that you'll be able to get from them. Uh, so think about those as well. Here are a few more thoughts about SBOMs, and that is that I think when we all start using them, and, and I'm sure we will, uh, it's going to prompt a big initial flood of data that will cost time and effort to sort through and to make decisions about. And that's as if we didn't already have enough or too much data that we are trying to wade through. Most organizations have more threat intel coming in than they can deal with, and they have more log data and alerts coming in than they can deal with. So SBOMs are just going to make that worse because we are going to get visibility, which will be great, but it'll be at a next level down, a, a granular level that we may not be prepared to look at. And uh, once again, decide who in your resource pool is going to have the time and ability to, to trace these down. Who is going to be consuming them? Uh, not just how is it going into your infrastructure, because again, I'm going to warn you, you're not going to be able to automate all of it. You may not even be able to automate any of it, especially at the beginning. You're going to have to annotate the disposition and the analysis of those SBOMs, and you're going to be ha have to answer questions based on them, especially if you're in the middle of a supply chain. So it's going to prompt a big initial flood of data. Think carefully about this. Uh, I really want to hear what, um, what the public sector is thinking about this uh, in light of the executive order. Now, if you don't already have a vulnerability management process working for what you learn about today, please don't add SBOMs to the mix. Again, I think it's just going to make your situation worse, uh, and I'm willing to, to fight about that. But, and here's an idea uh, that my colleagues and I had. If you are a small business and you've never been able to assess the vulnerability of your infrastructure before, SBOMs might be a good place to start um, it, with, you know, the assistance of a consultant or an MSSP or something like that. If you don't have the expertise to analyze it yourself, but just to collect SBOMs from your vendors. Uh, and again, you're probably going to be more reliant on those vendors than larger organizations are. But you just kind of want to know what it is that you're using and what it is that you're dealing with. It's a good exercise to go through and see not only what is in the SBOM that you get from your vendor, but what's your relationship with your vendor. It's even more important to test that part. If they hedge and say, well, you won't understand the SBOM, so we're not going to give it to you, or, oh, sure, here it is. No, we're not going to explain it to you. Then you may want to reconsider your relationship with that vendor. This is going to be a new level of relationship between customers and providers where they have to figure out how to have these dialogues and these negotiations around SBOMs. So these are my predictions 
for when we start using them, whenever that is. And then finally, I'm going to share some resources and uh, I'm going to ask Martin to do me a favor and copy and paste these into the 20th anniversary OWASP standard classification classification Slack channel so that you can click on them and look at them yourself. If as uh, if as a um, as a consumer, you decide you want to use S bombs and you want to ask for them in a vendor contract, the NTIA has a really good paper on how to do this. So I, I recommend that. Here's the Kenna prioritization to prediction link. It's a, I think it's a group of seven papers, but the statistic that I was quoting was from the very first one. And also, if you want to hear about how they're discussing labeling programs for consumers, here's a nice link to one of the, the workshop sessions. So I want to thank everybody for paying attention here and for singing along, if you sang along with me. And uh, I will see you over in the Slack.